Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Epic Gangster Tales. I figured I'd surprise you guys. I wasn't going to do a video this weekend, but I figured why not add a little bit of free time. And, and, you know, I've been wanting to touch on New York and other places too, because, you know, obviously I'm from the Boston area, you know what I mean? So I love all that. The Boston, Providence, New England Mafia, patriarchal crime family, mob law. But I mean, let's let's not let's not mistake the fact that New York and the five families is the crown jewel. You know what I mean? Everything runs through this. So with with that being said, let's take it out to New York. And for today's episode, we're gonna be getting into Gaspipe Casso, that nutball, his top hitman in the Lucchese crime family's bloody years. I'm really talking between 1986 and, and 91. Essentially, that's really kind of what we're gonna to touch on today. This is a huge story. But today's episode is gonna focus on his most vicious, most trusted hitman, George, Georgie Neck Zapola of the Lucchese crime family. Let's go ahead and get into the episode, guys. Georgie Neck Zapola was born in 1960 in the Bronx, New York. Um, you know, people often get confused because he ended up being such a big part of the Brooklyn faction later on, and we'll get into that, but he was born in the Bronx, New York. Um, but yeah, today's episode is, is going to be on Gas Pipe's personal mad dog killer himself, Georgie Zapola. You know, this guy is just a... a a tough dude and he's still around today you know um we're not going to touch too much on the recent stuff but man this guy you know what i mean like if you've read mob boss the uh the jerry capisci book about al diaco and all that oh man you know like it was like every other chapter this guy's whacking somebody out you know and Casso, you know what i mean like yeah enough said i think everybody knows who, who gas pipe Casso is um but yeah so anyways Zapola actually just somewhat recently came home, um, 2014, uh, after finishing up a 22-year sentence in which he took a plea deal like a lot of Lucchese gangsters back then, and that actually coined the term to Lucchese 22. There was so many defendants, so many defections, so many people when they flipped and stuff like that, and there was a lot of murderers because of, of Vicka Musso and Casso, you know, with the paranoia and this one and that one, trying to tie this one to this murder and that one to that murder, so everyone was all interwoven, and it just created a, a, a deadly, you know, treacherous family. The Lucchese families under Vic and, and Gas were, you know, and Vicka Musso still runs the family to this day, so they say, you know what I mean, uh, <laughs> locked away in the can, you know, um, but yeah, the Lucchese 22, there was a lot of them. There was a lot of them that got sentenced to plea deals for 22 years. Um, you know, and like I said, he... Zapola pled out to four murders, including murder conspiracy to kill members of the Lucchese crime family. Born and raised in the Bronx, Zapola later relocated to Brooklyn, New York in the mid-1980s. Zapola got acquainted with members of the Lucchese crime family's Brooklyn faction, you know, so he started to move into the area, started to assert himself and, and you know, figure out the who's who and, and this one and that one. Um, and this is where Gaspipe Casso comes into the picture. Um, Zapola gravitated towards Casso and it was then made... And, and then Zapola himself, after being a hang around with Casso and getting acquainted with him, and you know, him, showing him, you know, who he is and whatnot, he's eventually he's made into the Lucchese crime family. Um, and just like that, Georgie Neck Zapola became the yin to Casso's yang. Uh, a match made in organized crime heaven, you know. Um, gas pipe, a, a vicious, cunning leader who was extremely violent, and a young, vicious Zapola looking to make a name for himself and rise high in the family. It was just kind of the cohesion those guys had. You know, Casso was more the brains. Not that he couldn't pick up a gun and get busy too. Like, he definitely could. But he had people like your, you know, Zapola, your Lastorinos, your Georgie Contis, you know. Um, you know, and, and, you know, he would. He would rise high into the family, you know, eventually to Consigliere and etc., um, you know, but, but Zapola would become Gas Pipe's go-to guy when someone needed to go bye-bye. Um, Zapola, Zapola easily, easily was 
probably their most efficient killer, you know, um, especially for gas pipe. Those two were, you know, you can see them in surveillance pictures together and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, you know what I mean? Like, it, Zapola easily stood out in a crime family full of vicious hitters, you know what I mean? He, he stood out, and Castle chose him more often than not to get the job done. And in the late 80s, Zapola participated in the ambush murder of Lucchese mobster Michael Papadio. Family boss Vicar Musso and underboss Anthony Casso had ordered Papadio's death after he refused to give up one of his lucrative rackets, i.e. He, he was tied into the garment district. He was a, a money-making machine over there in the garment district. And, you know, they felt he was pinching pennies or whatnot, and they wanted to yank him out, not kill him, you know, but yank him out, which they knew wouldn't be easy, and insert their own guy, this Jewish guy, who was more efficient, more of like a human calculator type, rather than a slick mobster who's gonna make you these millions of dollars, but at the same time is gonna be parking in, you know, the, the breadcrumbs, and that, you know, they, they weren't having that. Um, you know, and... So they had ordered Papadio's death after he refused to give up the garment district. Um, you know, and it was a huge moneymaker, like I said. And, you know, and Papadio was old school. He was a stubborn old, you know, Italian mobster who'd been around forever. Um, he wasn't going to budge. I'm not, you're not taking my rackets. You're not kicking me out of here. You know, so it's only really one course of action for insubordinates on that, you know, on that level with those two, you know. Um, and, you know... After negotiations, if that's what you want to call it, fell through with Papadio, he was lured to a Lucchese-controlled bagel shop uh, by Al Diaco, Carmine Avellino, and George Sapola. The three mobsters ambushed Papadio in the kitchen area of the bagel shop. Al Diaco, a then-captain in the family, first smashed Papadio in the head with a steel cable. And the stubborn Papadio grabbed his head, kind of wobbled around. He was a lot bigger than, than little Al. And he, and he looked up at Al and said, What'd you hit me for, Al? And, you know, Al Diaco countered that question with another whack in the head, smacked him again. I guess he was probably trying to hit him so he'd fall to the ground, make the hit easier. The fucking guy wouldn't go down, right? So he's fucking bleeding everywhere all over the kitchen. They're fucking hitting him. And, um... You know, but he wouldn't go down. You know, this guy's fucking, you know, in the book, it's hilarious, this part. It's, it's, it's comedy. Um, but yeah, he, you know, it was at this point in which Zapola produced a 22 caliber pistol equipped with a silencer and shot twice into Papadillo's head. And, uh, in which he wobbled a little bit more. Now he's, you know, two, two in the head, the 22, you know, point blank range. And he still, he goes down on, on one knee and he's like half dead, still on one knee, you know, making death noises and stuff. And uh, at that point, Zipola stated, this fucking guy don't want to fucking die. So then he puts the, the 22 back in his waistband, pulls out a 357 snub nose from his coat pocket, puts it up to his head, squeezes again, and boom. That one did the trick. He collapses to the ground. He essentially stops moving, stops making noises, and uh, there goes Michael Papadillo. Um, you know, the mobsters then took Papadillo's body to a funeral home, um, which was controlled by someone in the Lucchese family, um, and they cremated the body. Go figure, you know what I mean? Like, so... <laughs> Not only were they efficient enough to, to whack you out and get you out of the way, they're cremating bodies and stuff, getting, you know, just uh, crazy time, you know. And this is this is a topic that really, really I, I love. I find the Bonanno family and the Lucchese family extremely interesting, you know. And we're going to get into a whole lot more, but I figured, you know me, right? I always do the most vicious, most ruthless, you know, uh, mobsters, gangsters, bank robbers, whatever. So I figured we'd, we'd take our crack into New York today with, with Georgie Nexapolo, who's just, you know, mad dog to the mad dogs. And, um, yeah, in 1990, Zapolo was up to official captain of the Lucchese crime family. And in 1990, Zapolo would have his number called again as well by Vicamuso and Gaspipe. 
They would order Zapola and his equally vicious and deadly pal, fellow Lucchese mobster, Georgie Conti, um, you know, Brooklyn mobster, tough, tough guy. If you watch Jimmy Calandra's channel, he touches on him a lot. Um, Jimmy's got a great channel, um, and he can touch more on that stuff with the Georgie Contis and stuff. But they ordered the two of them together um, to tie up a potential loose end that was probably not necessary, but Castle was a paranoid nutball. So, you know, um, fuck the peace talks, essentially, you know. Um, and on a bright May morning in 1990, James D. Bishop, a Democratic district leader and former head of the Painters Union, was backing his Lincoln sedan into a parking spot in Whitestone, Queens, when a barrage of bullets ended his life. Um, and from the start of the investigation, um, investigators and authorities labeled the killing as a mob hit. Federal authorities stated that Mr. Bishop was killed by the Lucchese crime family, uh, which feared he was about to testify in a corruption investigation, which was tied into like all that, which essentially caused a big fracas in the Lucchese family. You know, the Windows case with, with uh, that had gas pipe and Vic, and uh, you know, even had that, that's what kind of, you know, jammed up Chin Giganti too. Um, this kind of came out of that with all the splintering of that. And they thought this guy was cooperating and was gonna flip and he wasn't. Um, you know, just another person, you know, Castle had a dream about or something, you know. I had a dream, this guy rad, we gotta, we gotta take him out. You know, next thing you know, this guy's on Channel 7 fucking news. Um, but yeah, as far, as far as the authorities are concerned, he was not cooperating. Mr. Bishop was shot eight times as he sat in his car by George Sapola and Georgie Conti. Uh, the late 80s and early 90s were extremely treacherous and violent for mobsters in the Lucchese crime family. In a blood purge fueled with paranoia and the labeling of false rats as an excuse to whack out anybody that Casso deemed untrustworthy, you know, maybe flinched when Casso fought it or something, and, you know, hey, he's gotta go. It was that silly, it was that sick with, with these two guys. And Vicar Musso kind of followed Casso's lead until the end, you know. Um, but, you know, some... Uh, but through it all, some mobsters made the best of a chaotic period in the Vic and Gas days. And Zapolo is a shiny example of how he rose fast, acting as Castle's right hand and peacemaker, even if the murders weren't necessarily, you know, warranted or whatnot. Zapolo just, you know, he followed orders, he didn't question it, and, you know, he rose high fast, you know. Um, Zappolo was a mad hatter, you know, and another example of how serious of a hitter Zappolo was, another man, Richard Taglianici, 33, was dating Zappolo's sister-in-law, and then after a blow-up involving Richard Taglianici and another one of Zappolo's family members, Tagli Taglianici was ambushed by a ski-masked hitman who jumped out of a van and cut him down in a hail of bullets. Uh, the man's mother claimed the shooting death of her son was a result of the argument um, between Taglianici and Zapola's relative. And, you know, this was another murder that Zapola pled out to when he got the, uh, you know, when he took his plea deal. And uh, Zapola pled out to, and Zapolo, Zapola and other Lucchese mobsters plotted and attempted to kill then acting boss Al, little Al Diaco, um, at the Kimberly Hotel in Manhattan, but a slick Diaco caught the move um, to hit him when he spotted a concealed handgun in mobster Mikey DeSantis's waistband prior to him going into the bathroom. Um, you know, and this was enough to, you know, a frantic Al Diaco scurried from the hotel room. You know, he had like Lacerino and all them in chase, Avellino and all them. Like, wait, no, 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 come on. We got, we get the meeting still. Don't go, you know, like, and he's like, yeah, yeah, I'll see you later. I'll see you guys later, you know, like, so that sent him out of there. He peeped the move. And uh, essentially that sent him right into the arms of the FBI. And that would be devastating for the Lucchese crime family, especially for the Vic and Gas administration, which Sepola played a huge part in. Um, you know, 
as well as other high-profile Lucchese mobsters targeted for death by Vicar Musso and Gaspipe, you know, your Pete Chiotos and, you know, a bunch of those guys in the New Jersey faction of the Lucchese family, you know, and you try to hit a guy and they survive, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to come back to get whacked again? No, they're going to go and, and go to the FBI, to, you know? Especially if they have, you know, uh, a lot of guys in the Lucchese and, and Bonanno family, some of them had sons and stuff like that that would get made, you know what I mean? Like, so, Al Diaco and his son, Joseph Diaco, who was a, a tough kid in his own right, too, he had a couple hits under his belt. Um, you know, they ultimately agreed to go to the FBI. There was no other course of action, get killed or cooperate, you know? And um, ultimately... Al Diaco's testimony buried Vicar Musso and Gaspite Castle. Um, they went on the run in 1990 and put him, uh, Al Diaco, in charge as acting boss. And, you know, they <laughs> they planned on demoting him, you know, down from acting boss by uh, means of burial, you know. And it um, didn't quite work out that way. But um, Gaspite Castle, the psychopath, you know, who exterminated half of New York and a quarter of the fucking Lucchese family... Um, you know, itself for the assumption someone may flip or, you know, uh, whatever. The guy was a weird guy at Castle. And, um, you know, he himself flips. You know what I mean? And, you know, go figure. The, the guy who's whacking this one and that one for rat, rats. You know what I mean? Like, it was mind-boggling when I, when I first read, the, you know, a couple books on Castle. Um, you know, but go figure. The FBI bled him for all his info, right? And then they ripped up his plea deal on some bullshit. You could tell it was staged. They were never going to cut this guy loose. They were never going to play ball with him. He was too maniacal, too cunning, too violent. You know, 33-something murders he was charged with. Um, you know, but serves him right. That's what he gets for fucking, you know what I mean? All that shit that he did, and, you know, um, serves him right. They, they, you know, made up some bullshit thing. Oh, well, you sneezed on a fellow inmate, we're ripping up your agreement. You know, that comes around, goes around. Anyways, you know. Um, he ultimately ran it for nothing. You know, he got nothing. So there goes his honor, there goes his, his name in the streets. Everything he did as a man in the mafia, finito, you know. Um, but major defections in the family forced a lot of people into the can, um, including eventually in 1996, George Sapola was one of many to, to plea out and take a 22-year plea deal. Um, he was released in 2014 and is now supposedly semi-retired, um, still in the New York area, I believe, and maybe they lean on him for information here and there and stuff like that. But as far as I know, um, he's not really playing a big role these days. Um, but anyways, I figured no one better to break into New York and start, start chopping it up with the New York mob stories and stuff like that too. So this is the first of many. So I hope you guys had a good weekend. Thank you guys for tuning in. And as always, this has been another episode of Epic Gangster Tales. Please like, comment, share, and guys, most importantly, I can't stress it enough, subscribe. It makes a huge difference. The channel is growing week by week, day by day. The views are going up. Subscribers are going up. Um, you know, I just want to thank everybody for rocking with me. I've, I've had some trying times lately and you know what? You know, some of you guys' comments, some of you guys just showing love and watching the videos uh, are rocking with the channel. I can't stress how much it means. So I just want to thank you guys and I'll see you again next week. Take care.